All right, we're here today for another CMC Rescue podcast. This time the subject is going to be backcountry rescue, which is kind of a wide-ranging topic, and we're going to see where it goes. Uh, I should probably start by introducing myself. My name is John McKentley from CMC Rescue, um, formerly the school director from CMC, now just an instructor. And uh, first up, as so you get used to their voices, I'll go alphabetical on first names just because that's the way I listed them. Bruce Parker. Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Parker. I'm currently a member of La Plata County Search and Rescue in Durango, Colorado. I've been a member for nine years. And prior to that, I was a member of the Montrose Search and Rescue team in Los Angeles County for 33 years. Thanks, Bruce. And I also spent some time teaching for CMC. <laughs> oh, interest of full disclosure. Craig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Craig McClure. Actually, I live just down the road from Bruce. We could have met and done this together. I'm in Mancus, Colorado. I own a small training company called the Cracker Jack Group. And I have a long history before we moved here with uh, an MRA team, Deschutes County Mountain Rescue, uh, and some other rescue teams uh, along the way. Thanks, Craig. And not, not least, certainly Fred Salazar. Hi, I'm Fred Salazar. Uh, firefighter paramedic uh, for a metropolitan fire department along the front range in Colorado. Uh, been out here for about 25 years, got seven years as an industrial rescuer, and I'm also an instructor for CMC. Thanks, Fred. Well, just to start it off, I said the topic was uh, backcountry rescue, and backcountry might be defined different ways for different people. So, um, why don't you all kind of think about that and give me what you would say makes a country uh, a rescue backcountry as opposed to uh, urban or interface or suburban or whatever else you want to say. Um, Fred, you want to go with that start? Sure. Uh, with a little bit of a different background, being more of a fire department base as opposed to a SAR based team. Uh, for me, backcountry is anything that any place where we have to hike all of our equipment in where you know, I can't just run back to the big red truck and grab more stuff. Um, you're going in miles, hours, um, and you have what you take with you and nothing more, nothing less. So, you know, I don't have the convenience of my big red fire truck to go get more webbing ropes, carabiner, stuff like that. Is there any sort of a time or distance or is it, you can't see the truck anymore or it's a half a mile or anything that defined? Uh, I don't. I don't give it a definition, but you know, if if I'm having to hike in an hour, um, that's kind of a, a a distance away from any additional resources that I would have. Um, and unlike a SAR team, uh, most fire departments we're not ready to camp out overnight with a victim or something like that. Whereas you have your search and rescue teams. That's what they train for: the inclement weather. They're bringing everything they need to spend. 24 hours, if not more, out there conducting the rescue. That's a really good point that you brought that up, and I hope that we come back to that a little bit on personal uh, PPE and uh, just the equipment that's required for some some backcountry if it's uh, a little more inclement weather. How about you, Craig? What's a backcountry rescue? I think Fred did a pretty good job, um, but I think there's a continuum, and I think I'd start with if you're hiking in your turnouts and you think, I don't want to hike any farther, that's probably <laughs> backcountry. Um, but, but it could be, I mean, it could be 20 minutes with a, with a lot of vertical where you don't want to hike the big gear. It could be a helicopter flight um, and, and 10 pounds of gear. I think there's, there's a pretty wide spectrum in what we're calling backcountry. Bruce, you come from a, a team that was in one direction and then not necessarily 180 degrees, but certainly a different organization now. Yeah, well, um, in Los Angeles County, most people who've never been there don't realize how much wilderness there really is right there by the city. It's not doesn't take very long to get up into the mountains, but once you get off the road, you, you end up in backcountry pretty quickly. Um, it, to me, it's kind of if you uh, have a chance of not being able to get out and having to spend the night, it kind of turns into backcountry. Um, here, um, we have a, you know a variety of ways to get into the backcountry, and besides hiking, um, you know we go up to the Chicago Basin, and you can, might take the steam locomotive up the canyon to you know hike in <laughs> from there. Uh, 
but if the train's not there on the way back, it becomes even a lot longer hike out. So backcountry can 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 change. All right, thanks. And then uh, just no no definitions, but um, you know my experience still being active as a rescuer in Los Angeles County is that uh, you know the definition used to be that it was a search and rescue team when the when when it was off the fog line or you know not on the side of the road and. That's been expanded a little bit, and it's something that we'll probably get into later in the topic. But um, there's there's really not been a good definition of it. The state tried. Uh, it's it's more on who's responsible for it, and I think it varies throughout the country. And of course, we're probably a lot of Westerners here on this particular podcast, and it's going to vary when you get further east as far as who performs the rescue. And then, uh, of course, true wilderness doesn't exist in many of those places anyway. Um, I had taught, proposed a topic about volunteers, and I think backcountry rescue, I, as an MRA person, Craig was an MRA person, Bruce was, that we talk about um, primarily uh, volunteer labor, and um, that's kind of a big deal. Let me start this time with Craig on that subject. Yeah, this is this is a hot button with me, and if, you, if we've been in class together, you've heard it. Um, I, I approach it from coaching on the training side. For, for teams, uh, I think one of the most damaging things we do for a retention on a team is train poorly and train inefficiently. And I, I've been on a lot of teams and there's always this push to up recruitment, do more public facing stuff, get more people coming in the door. And rarely do we stop and look and figure out why there's a hole in the bucket and people keep falling out the bottom. And if we can improve retention uh, by improving some of our training practices, and I think specifically um, having an SOP, having documented training, having a way that says, this is how we do it. And if you do it this way, it's okay. What's so damaging is when someone new, you know, sets up your lowering system the way they've been taught. And another experienced person comes over and says, well... That's okay, but what I like is, and we just, we degrade and we erode people so quickly with that kind of behavior. Um, and I think that's the big retention issue. So I'd rather, I'd rather see a, a conversation on retention than recruiting, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I know a couple of those things, uh, probably Bruce has something to say about not only the SOPs and, uh, and, and that, but uh, the whole training aspect. Well, uh, here, we don't really have a problem with recruiting. We have way more people um, wanting to join the rescue team than we really have ability to, to keep active. Um, we have to be pretty, you know, pick, uh, picky a little bit uh, just because experience kind of tells you we have a lot of college students from the fort that come in, they're outdoorsy, they want to, they want, they see the rescue team, they want to join. And, but you know that by the time they get trained, they're they're going to be gone anyway because they'll graduate and move on to something else. Um, retention to me is keeping people involved. And Craig's thing about training is it. Um, this team is not as active as my old team in Los Angeles County. We don't have as many calls. Um, and I remember. Back in L.A., it was like when we had slow periods, everyone was on everybody's throats and everything. And then we start having a bunch of calls and uh, and then everybody was everybody's friend again. Um, here here we never have a whole bunch of calls. We have we they come in flurries sometimes and we have long, long uh, gaps. Um, so training is the way that I think you have to, you know, keep people involved um, and. Uh, Good training. Um, this this area, we work closely with Durango Fire. We also work with Upper Pine River Fire. We work with uh, San Juan Search and Rescue up in Silverton. Um, and the one good thing is everybody uses the same technique. We all train together. When the fire department has trainings, the rescue team is invited. Um, we invite the Silverton crew down when we have our trainings. Um, we train with the upper pine. Everybody uses the same technique. So even when we get new people in, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have taken 
rigging for rescue classes and other classes and was familiar with a lot of things. And so even though it was different than what we did in Los Angeles County, I was familiar with what this team did. And uh, so um, even though the second call I was ever on when I first moved here um, was, was a good rescue, and I'd never met 90% of the people we worked with, I knew what they were doing and we all worked well together because we do train together and we have you know the same uh, equipment um, and the same techniques. So that really helps, but keeping people involved, requiring that they come to training keeps the, the, uh, the people involved. And that's the most important part I find uh, in retention. Fred, representing a career department or at least being a member of a career department, it's retention is probably a little bit different, but you'd mentioned earlier that a lot that you're on a kind of a sometimes a training department. So right. how's it I, working on your side? And so my agency, we work um, hand in hand in certain areas with uh, an MRA SAR team based here in El Paso County. Um, and I think one of the big differences I've seen in talking to some of the other SAR people is, um, is there's a different level of dedication. Um, some of the SAR people I know, uh, the teams they work for, they're having to purchase their own gear, whether it's inclement weather gear, uh, approach shoes. Um, well, the sheriff's office or their team provides the big stuff. The individual members forking out a lot of cash uh, for personal equipment. So I think that drives a certain amount of dedication. But I also think that is a disincentive sometimes because people say, well, I got to spend, you know, 500 bucks for some winter gear or whatever it may be. Um, whereas working for a fire department, our agency provides the majority of our gear. Um, but what I see is some of our folks coming in and I think I think Bruce and, and Craig both uh, alluded to it. It looks really cool um, until they see maybe how much work it is or, hey, I didn't realize I'm not a big height, work at heights kind of guy. And, you know, we get them all trained up and we spend the money, we buy the gear, and then they're like, yeah, I'm out. Um, so, um, you know, our special operations teams here uh, in my agency – uh, whether it's our dedicated high angle rescue teams, our heavy rescue team, our hazmat teams, whatever it may be, um, you basically sign that contract when you say you want to get into that program that, hey, you're going to give us a minimum of two or three or five years because of what it's going to cost to bring you up to speed, get you equipped and stuff like that. So I think that's really the big difference I see between maybe a fire department based team and some of the, the SAR teams around the country. Craig, you've been on teams in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's wet there. What? It's just wet. It's just west? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in, in your experience there, what was it, it like to, for retention as far as that? And you, how's that relating to training? Easy in, easy out, or, uh, you know? I was going to actually ask to interject here after Fred was done uh, ahead, on just yeah. this point. Easy in, easy out is the problem, I think. Uh, on the general SAR side, so you have the you know, ground pounders all uh, on a multidiscipline team, we observe the average is three to, three to four years is mm. what you got out of a person, which isn't enough by the time you invest in them. So I think especially with the technical teams, um, you need to allow that team to be elite and act elite. There are a lot of places that in the re in the recruiting, they don't want it. They don't want to exclude people, and they want to be wel welcoming. And if you want to draw elite people, and that's what you need on the rescue side, you have to build the club they want to be part of. Because you, they don't show up for the agency calling them. They generally sometimes aren't even really showing up for the for the subject. They're showing up because their friends are going out and putting themselves at risk, and you need that bond. And that bond comes through, I think, through some of the elitism. And I think that's the difference. It's very well spoken about that. And I, the easy in, easy out was kind of my slang for the thing coming from a team that had um, 
pretty heavy requirements from not only the team, but especially from the department to be able to do it. And, and our, our average is running over 20 years. And, um, that's kind of, you know, uh, it's probably extreme in a lot of cases, but I know that some people, like Bruce mentioned, they get a lot of college students or something like that. They're there, they're good for a while, and then they're gone right away. And, uh, it's unfortunate because so many other people have to expend not only the equipment that Fred was talking about, but also all that training time when you just uh, when you lose them. Bruce, you had the contrast of the two of them. You have something to say on that? Well, you know, starting in uh, L.A. County, um, you've got a year invested uh, with the department requirements before you even get to the rescue team. So you've already got a, a big investment in time and. Uh, you don't want to give that up, which I think is why you do real well there as far as retention. Uh, here, it it is it it's better than it now than it used to be. When I started, it was very easy in. Um, now we have interviews, we have training requirements for new members that are a lot more extensive than we started out with, and so you get a little bit more of a investment. Um, here, we don't provide any equipment. Everybody buys all their own gear. Where back in LA, again, the sheriff's department provided harnesses, helmets, all the hardware, um, the Gore Tex, the you know, all that stuff. Here, you're buying all your own stuff. But at the same time, most of the people that live here all have winter gear. I mean, this is what they do. You know, ice climbing is what they do every weekend. Um, in the winter and, you know, backcountry skiing is, is what they do. So most of them have the gear. Um, they're just now finding another way to use it. Um, we do have some members that have been on for 20, 20 plus years here. Um, but then we have some that, uh, you know, come for a couple of years and then all of a sudden they just kind of drift off. Um, and, unfortunate but uh they you know they don't get into that i want to be here um there's some some members that have been doing this for years and they do want to be here and that's what you try and instill in the new people is the fact that you'll fall in love with this if if you make the investment to, to be a member okay kind of segueing um both between training and, and retention, as Craig brought out, is really, really related. And it also comes into competency. Um, Fred, you're, you work with M MRA team. If you work with El Paso, you've obviously, in a fire department, you're dealing with NFPA standards. And uh, you can't have a discussion about backcountry or wilderness rescue without mentioning the MRA, which I think just about everybody has done already. And um, so... That's in, and you guys are all Coloradi Coloradians now. Um, have a different MRA approach to the competency than we do in this California region. But um, why don't we talk about uh, the training and the retention part of that? Fred, you're up. Um, I mean, you're almost uh, comparing apples to pears. Um, <laughs> they're kind of the same, but they're a little bit different. Um, Part of it is training is relatively easy for a fire department because you're paid to be somewhere for X amount of time. You're going to do your training. Uh, for a lot of SAR teams that are volunteer based, those folks have real jobs and they're having to take time away from their family, other commitments to dedicate the time. And it takes a huge commitment to get trained up to a, a good level where you can work autonomously. Um, I don't want to open up Pandora's box, but you start getting into equipment selection um, and, you know, smaller, lighter, faster. And I'm not staring right at you, Craig, but I'm staring right at you. Um, but but a, a fire guy, we don't like to hear that. We want big and burly. Um, but take, take, for example, 12.5 millimeter rope, roughly eight, 8.5 pounds per hundred feet. And the new 11 mil rope that has 40 can. That's five pounds per hundred feet. And then you get into some of the, the small diameter, eight millimeter, nine millimeter ropes, even less than that. Um, you know, that's where I'm talking about apples to pears, um, where you're doing backcountry, you're pulling in 
and you're hiking in or flying in your equipment. Whereas most city fire guys, we have big red trucks to move stuff where I can get an ATV. Um, you know, Bruce mentioned he's able to take uh, a, a train to a certain area. We have the same same ability if necessary to get on top of Pikes Peak. Uh, but it's the availability of, of some of those bigger resources to move the smaller resources. Fred, this Craig. is Craig. I want to I want to point Craig out. Craig wants to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> one, you guys apparently paved all the way to Pikes Peak, so that's kind of a cheat. <laughs> and and Bruce said it was a steam train. So you got to give him credit for how old that train is. <laughs> we have a narrow gauge. There you go. Yeah, I I Fred, I do sometimes get pigeonholed as a guy who's beating the lightweight drum, uh, and, and I just want to be careful to say it's. It's an application for a purpose and a time and place. Absolutely. Um, if you can drive the big red truck, take take the big gear that gives you a little bit more margin, you probably have more familiarity with, um, and, and frankly, right now, has better manufacturer support with, uh, w- with more available devices that play well with it. So as you skinny down the gear, you have to, you have to up the training. Yep. Those things have to go hand in hand. I, I think it's interesting. I generally, I'm going to probably lose customers for saying this. I generally enjoy training volunteers more than paid. You show up to train a volunteer department. You have people that are already vested in being there. They're giving something up to be there. Um, it, you do get paid departments where you get that level of enthusiasm. And if you can generate that enthusiasm in a class, great. Um, uh, I've never had a volunteer team stop because they were going to bump into overtime. And it, it, I think they're, they're almost two different training environments and, and you have to, you have to gear your, your agenda and your drive towards, towards who you're teaching. Just for the listeners who can't see us, there's a lot of head nodding here when Craig made that statement about the volunteers and overtime and all of that sort of thing. When they're there on their own dime, they're definitely highly motivated. And there's different laws that apply as far as pay and stuff like that. That when it's volunteerism, you don't run into that those federal laws as far as pay and compensation. Yeah, you can beat them like a rented mule. You can't do that to a paid guy. No. Yeah. Yeah. How about maintaining competency and standards and things like that? Anybody? Well, we uh, here we instituted uh, skills testing yearly where we require everyone to uh um well at at the kind of at the beginning of the spring we have a our on rope day where they uh kind of come in and show their uh proficiency you know on rope rappelling ascending and stuff so we know that when we get out in the field that that we can trust them and we feel safe um you know having them go and maybe be the one that rappels down into the canyon bottom to to be the patient for training Um, and then we do our trainings and then at the end of the summer, we, we do a skills test, um, day where we get people to come in and go through several stations to demonstrate proficiencies. I mean, that's something we instituted three or four years ago. Anybody else? Craig, you got anything on that one? Of course I do. Um, (laughs) You you have to, you've, you've got to set a bar for people to try to jump over. Um, and Maybe to dig myself out of the hole I created with my last statement. Um, There are people out there doing it. Uh, Orlando Fire has a skills test now to be on their tech team. And those guys have some pretty serious climbing and fitness requirements. So I'm I'm seeing more of that. I'm seeing the bar being raised because we're starting to treat the tech side of this as its its own profession, as as its own specialty. Uh, It's becoming less of a of a bonus assignment because you get, you get some extra training time and, and, and some time off to go play. Um, and, and it, it thrives where departments and, and teams put in high standards and then hold people those standards. Uh, we did that in Deschutes County. We put in a, a test kind of like Bruce was talking about to, to the MRA levels. And then we realized that people were hitting that level and tapering off, mm-hmm. you know, Hey, I got my support level done. I don't have to show up to training anymore. So we had to put in a biannual test to say, you now have to come in every two years. Is that the proper use of biannual guys? Yeah. Biannual, biannual. 
One of those is twice a year. One is every other year. Yeah. It's the every other year one I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where they had to come back and show that competency two years later, two years later, two years later. Or they lost that or they lost that certification. And that was something have, that was done on the county level, you said? Yep. Yeah. And we got pushback. I don't I doubt that. Yeah. Go ahead, Fred. And, and I think coming from the fire side, you know, everybody knows fire departments are NFPA driven. So a lot of the, the job performance requirements and checkoffs are in your NFPA documents. And whether we test to those or evaluate to those, um, sounds like uh, a lot of the SAR teams have job performance checkoffs that mirror the tasks that they're, they do. Um, but like you guys are saying, it, it takes you to a certain level and those job performance requirement checkoff sheets don't test critical thinking. And I no. think, I think when we're talking about back country and we're talking about some of our rescuers, we're, there's that expectation that there's that critical thinking where they're not thinking A to D, they're thinking A to Z and they can get all the way through. So if I am using an eight millimeter cordage, I understand. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's a perfect example. I understand there's a different safety factor than a 12.5. And if I'm using aluminum carabiners versus a steel carabiner or a NFPA G rated versus a T rated. There's those critical thinking skills that are required that those those job checkoff sheets and NFPA, and I can only assume for some of the SAR stuff, really don't test. And that comes back to how much time do they have on the team? Because that's not something that you develop overnight. I'm going to go into Bruce because I know he has an opinion on this thing, something that Craig said about it. Um, the, the testing, and that's something that we've done on our team um, that we drove. It's, 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 it's a county requirement of a list of skills that you need to show competency on um, every other year. It was just, it went to every other year, whether exactly how you define that, but good point, Craig, is that um, to do it every year, you spend all your time testing, and to set the tests up takes quite a bit of time. And uh, you're, you're missing other things while you're doing these skills, but they're so important. And one of the things that, that I've always had a little bit of an issue with is, one, making sure that the tests were, were current. In other words, they, they reflect the way we were doing things now rather than the way we might have done things a few years ago. And my big issue has always been, and I think this is what both of you have said already, is that people now are training to take the test. And they know they can do the skills to do whatever it is they have to do, either ascend a rope, descend a rope, pass a knot with the system, or whatever it happens to be. And then when you have to put it into a, a less standardized testing environment, they have a hard, hard time doing it. And I, I would like to find a better way to do that. But um, why don't you talk about that, Bruce? Because you've gone from one way to another to try to institute that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I was around in uh, with you know, the team in LA when we instituted that. And there were just so many skills that they required that, you know, we we did half one year and the other half the next year. But the fact that you had to keep, keep doing it, you know, it wasn't just one test to get on and then you were done. It, it That, I think, um, started, you know, steering the training to pass the test rather than, you know, really know the know the product. And so I understand where you're coming from. Um, here again, uh, it's, it's really kind of new and no one, we don't really train to pass the test. Um, cause it's something that no one even thinks about until all of a sudden they realize it's there. Um, we just, we go and, you know, train at what we feel is the current need, um, or logistically works, you know, for what we have and the number of people we have, um, I mentioned earlier we work with the fire department here and where I've been places where the fire department and the SAR team didn't get along as well as they probably could have, um, to be put it nicely. Here, everybody loves everybody. And when the fire department gets a call that, that's off the side of the road, the search and rescue team gets called right away. And when we get a call, the fire department gets called because they're the paramedics. Um, but we train 
with the same techniques. Um, the fire department is paid and volunteer in, in Durango. Um, I, I see that uh, their paid people sometimes have as much or more respect for the volunteers than, than they, you know, as far as skills go. And uh, a lot of times um, they look to the SAR people as, as, as really the more skilled people because we tend to do it more because we love it. And we're not training with a lot of other things. The fire part of it, the medical part of it um, is a little different for them. Um, but, uh, you know, so it, it kind of works good, but it could work a lot better. That's for sure. You mentioned medical, and that was something that was on my list, and it relates both to the um, recurrent training, because there it's mandated by state law or maybe local um, for recurrent, you know, recurrent training and things like that. And you mentioned the fire department does the medical, which is not unusual. Fred, you're a paramedic. You've got to maintain standards and obviously like that. Your department, do you supply the medical for the wilderness team when they're out there? Or is it just a call that you're on and they do something of their own? And if so, what do they do? Um, so Colorado, um, and, and here the medical directors have a very broad brush of what they can allow their folks to do. Uh, so our uh, SAR team in the area, they have physicians uh, on their team. They've got uh, what used to be called EMT intermediates. Now they're EMT advanced where they can do almost everything a paramedic can minus a few skill sets. Um, so they bring their own medical to it. Um, sometimes we go and augment them if they need the, the additional help. Um, where we run into a little bit of a, a hiccup, though, is if we call for a military Blackhawk to do a hoist and they have a medical person aboard the helicopter, Military medicine doesn't necessarily line up with civilian medicine as far as <laughs> who can do what. Um, but what I've noticed is, at least in Colorado, is most of the SAR teams have an, their own medical component where they're self-sufficient. So the fire department, if they come in, are just an extra set of hands or vice versa. Uh, if they come to help us, they're an extra set of hands um, for, for what we need. Uh, the one thing I will add to it, though, is fire departments really aren't set up for wilderness backcountry search where the SAR teams are. Uh, they're, they're more in tune to, to what all that means. Greg, regarding medical, your experiences uh, in Deschutes or elsewhere? Very, very similar to, uh, to Fred. Um, so I'm, I'm just an EMT. So I'm a guy with Band-Aids and oxygen and not much more. Um, I can tell if you're going to die. I just can't tell how to fix it. Uh, we, uh, we really, we supplied all the medical resources, uh, once it went off pavement and we transferred care generally back at the edge of the pavement. So we had, again, like Fred said, fairly liberal and very engaged medical directors. Uh, our medical directors trained with the teams were outdoors people and really understood the environment they were sending people to work in. Um, they would do things such as give us protocols to, to see CPR without, uh, calling for permission, um, would opened up some, some different drug protocols that were effective and necessary when you're, when you have a three hour pack out of a critical patient, you can't get advanced care to them. Uh, it was really just good coordination and trust from the fire department and, and letting, and them knowing that they had the right people out there to do it. Uh, when we needed help, they were certainly willing to, to do it. Uh, we we put firefighters in our own gear out of our truck and thrown them on the back of a snowmobile and driven them into a scene, and they're happy to do it. Um, but we, there was a lot of respect, um, kind of what, what Bruce is getting at, that each team had had their specialty, and, and and you need to learn to play together with those two. Yeah, I'm sure that a lot of that is going to vary around the country. We don't know where our listeners are, but... That's one of those things that sometimes comes up is who's going to do it and what's the level of control and what's the level of care. And it comes right down to it. It's like we talk about it in a confined space, too. Um, you're not going to take all this expensive equipment into the confined space, and you may not be able to take it into the wilderness just because of the batteries, the weight, 
the damage to the gear and there's only so much you can do out there and you're just going to do it and get them out of there. So it, yeah, it, I, I, John, I'm going to jump in again. Cause it's yeah, what go I, ahead. Um, I was actually having a conversation with one of Bruce's teammates the other night. Um, and that on the backcountry volunteer side, you very rarely deal with someone who's on that knife edge of survival. Um, their fate is pretty well determined by the time you get to them. If they've survived for the time it took for your team to get the call, rally resources, get to the trailhead, get to the back, you know, get through the country and get to them. Um, you, you, you're not dealing with someone who's going to die on you right there. And, and the necessity for a higher level of care, I don't think is as necessary as people believe. Um, if you can keep them stable, you can transport them to a higher level of care. And then essentially transport speed becomes your method of care. Very true. We used to use the expression, it sounds a little cold, is either they're stable or they're dead. Yep. Um, the gold, the golden hour is gone before anybody's getting into the, the wilderness area. And even in the areas that have uh, huge air support assets, like we have in Los Angeles County, just the time between the incident and the notification and the mobilization of the resources, even if they're flying the golden hour, if, if as you were, is pretty much gone in most cases anyway. So it's, it's very, very, very true. Not every, I think that takes a certain amount of experience on the part of the, the medical providers to sometimes realize that. I know we've had some clashes in the backcountry with people that um, didn't really realize that, but uh, it comes up there. Fred mentioned search, and we've been talking about rescue, and um, of course that's obviously um, more dramatic, but until you find them in some cases, you don't know if you need to rescue them if you want to follow that locate and access uh, process, the last process. And um, Fred, you said you don't do searches or you do? or Well, you know, we'll start. We have a, a lot of area that um, our fire department jurisdiction and the jurisdiction that the SAR team has butt up against each other. And again, it just so happens that most of our lost people get called in right at sunset. I don't know if they plan it that way or what. That's a rule. It has to be, yeah. Um, but like I said earlier, most fire department-based rescue teams aren't uh, really outfitted to go out overnight, make an ice cave, uh, take out, you know, uh, wiggy bags and stuff like that, whereas the SAR team is. Um, and, well, a fire department my size can't dedicate a couple of 80 people to do a search because we still have to provide service to the city, you know, some SAR teams, they can rally 60 people with ATVs, horses, snow machines, or snowmobiles, depending on where you're from, um, to, to accomplish the same task. So again, it's a lot of those, what I call soft resources, which are the people that some of the SAR teams can bring in that not every fire department has, has access to. Well, I think it's tough for any career agents, any, any agency at all, to not be able to do a big search effort without volunteers. And um, that's that's always been the, I mean, that's really how it all started probably is, well, we searched and now we found them. How are we going to get them out of there? And um, that was it. Is there any sort of definition? I know one person has, has suggested that if you can draw a line around the incident, if you know where the people are, that one agency might respond, but if it's an unknown, then it usually falls to law enforcement or the search and rescue team. Anything that defined with anybody? I don't know that we have uh, anything that defined. Um, you know, uh, where I live, there's a, a big park two streets down from where I live where we get people lost, either mountain biking or hiking and stuff like that. The park is, is a couple of hundred acres, and there's been times that Hey, the fire department, the police department will call in for the, the SAR team just to do some of the tracking. Um, and they have, again, the, re the soft resources being the people that they can hit several trails at once. Uh, my area, we don't have the air asset that we used to. And, you know, drones can only do so much. And after dark, they really don't help unless you've got thermal imaging on them. I want to go back to something that, that Craig said, but it's going to re relate a little bit to equipment. But in, instead of team gear or rescue equipment, it's more PPE. And I guess it's because I'm looking at you guys with pictures of snow behind you and not seeing snow out my window now. But having seen it, 
and that's the uh, the issue of uh, you know the proper equipment for the job. Craig Craig said that you know maybe uh, the definition is is when I want to hike in there and turnouts and and rubber boots or something like that. That's that's the dividing line between the 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 urban and the backcountry or something like that. Any issues as far as that with different responding agencies and gear and now all of a sudden we get into winter and we're talking about avalanche beacons and shovels and probes and all those sorts of things that may or may not come up. And um, that's an issue that we've seen so much, especially in a winter gear where the winter environment where you have so many specialized things. And um, it, it, it relates to backcountry. Obviously, there's a different set of equipment. Well, I don't know necessarily it's dedicated to backcountry. Um where I live, we're a metropolitan city, 400, 500,000 people. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a bomb cyclone uh, rip through El Paso County. And I was on a, a rescue task force. And we had chained up our four-wheel drive uh, Type 6 brush truck. And we were going to pull people out of cars that were stranded 8, 10, 12 hours. Um, but we don't have cold weather gear per se to be out in, you know, feet of snow. Lo and behold, what do I see? I see a snow cat with a snow trailer behind it. And our SAR team for the county was out doing snow rescues. And they had a couple of snow cats out and their guys were all in their winter attire and uh, they were dressed for the situation. So, and that happened in the middle of town as opposed to in the high country. Bruce, Craig? Well, I mean, here, because of the way the weather is, the fire department is is uh, fully equipped for snow. Um, they do have good winter gear. They do, uh, you know, have the ability to go in the field if, if necessary. They don't have enough, you know, people on duty, but they do have volunteers that they call in. Um, but keeping their medical expertise available uh, on a search um, when the area is fairly large, if you send them in and they're in the wrong area, it may not be the best choice anyway. And keeping them in reserve to be able to go quickly to where the, the you know your subject is is probably a better choice anyway. Um, but uh, here, everyone seems to have the gear. But as a volunteer, you're basically supplying your own, and that's just the way it is. Is Craig, I think there's a lot of garbage awareness training training out there. Uh, I don't think time spent on awareness of the hazards of working in the winter environment is, is ever time wasted. Uh, I did a lot of work with a team on the East Coast in a state that had mostly volunteer fire as their responders for wilderness search. And we spent a lot of time just teaching proper clothing and layering and equipment selection and just those simple things really improve their response capability. And they ended up buying snowshoes for the fire departments because they had kind of Fred situation. They had this, this kind of rural and urban interface responses in heavy snowstorms where they had to get to houses and they couldn't walk to them. So it was just it was teaching them the basics of the response and, and a little bit about, a, about equipment. Uh, I don't think there's a hard line. I think it's very, very regional. Uh, much like Prusik and Prusik. It just depends on where you are in the country, which one it is. Hey, that's an easy dividing line, the Mississippi River, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my question, is it the same dividing line as soda and pop? <laughs> no, no, no. That's definitely regional. <laughs> not not quite as defined as that one. Funny, when you travel around and train, you learn those sorts of things. Like It's like, oops, where am I? What am I going to say? And that sort of thing. Pop is definitely Midwest. In my house, soda and pop is dependent on what side of the bed you're in. Yeah. <laughs> because my wife's from Minnesota. <laughs> it's it's definitely a, a, a Midwestern thing on that one. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, that's one, and, and, it's, and it's probably more a Fred question. Do you have two sets of gear uh, if for, for technical rescue that, you know, I, I think the volunteer teams have what the volunteer teams have, but... Um, for a career department, would you have a, uh, a backcountry cache versus a front country cache or urban or whatever you want to call it? So the way uh, my department breaks it up, um, because we have uh, an area that's sitting behind me on my, my uh, background, 
is part of our response area. The two engine companies that would respond to that type of area are our high angle rescue companies. And they typically uh, have more of a wilderness, uh, lightweight harness, the 11 mil rope, uh, aluminum carabiners, um, not necessarily subscribing to the NFPA, but more of the UIAA and what an MRA team would carry. We also have a type one uh, heavy rescue team, which now we're getting into the 12.5 NFPA ropes, the typical uh, class two, uh, class three harness that you would see. So, well, the two teams can work hand in hand. The ones that predominantly would work in that wilderness backcountry area have the appropriate gear for the type of work they're going to do. Craig, I know you want to say that, maybe not for yourself, but um, you're ex- not, no, I don't mean it that way be- because, uh, but your experiences with training people, not only that, um, what, what you've seen with people that you're training as well as uh, your experiences as far as two caches of gear or going more towards lighter weight gear because it's more wildland and people are migrating that way maybe. So to, to the first part of your question, sadly, it's so often a financial resource issue. Mm-hmm. Um, the ability to have appropriate gear sometimes just comes down to what kind of money the department in the, in the community has. Um, I, I worked with the department that still had to put firefighters out in the snow and turnouts. And I talked to one guy and said, yeah, but I got two pairs of long johns. And, and that was the best they could do. Uh, there just wasn't money to solve the problem, uh, which is, is unfortunate. And, and hopefully that um, this might be a great topic for you guys later, but, but what are the grant programs to, to help people like that? Because we know there's money out there, just people don't know how to access it. And we shouldn't be putting people at risk because we can't afford to give them the right gear. So off my soapbox on that. Um, to kind of the, the lightweight question in, the, in this, recently I've been diving into this REMS concept. And I'm sure the California guys are familiar with it. The, the firefighter rapid extraction. And that's all over the map. Um, there are teams wanting to respond with 8 mil and there are teams responding with 13. Um, I don't think you can put a pin on it and say there's a movement towards one um, or there's there in that world, there isn't even a standard yet. And there's a lot of information. And in in some places, I think a lot of desire to go light without an understanding of what that means um, because it's the next cool thing. Uh, But I, I wish, I wish I could draw a map and, and figure out what's happening there. And, and maybe you guys, uh, especially in the CMC school, who have pretty broad geographic reach, have better answers on, on what's happening. So I'm going to toss it back at you. I, I don't know about better answers what's happening, but it's, a, it's appropriate that you brought it up about backcountry because, well, um, it may be a burned out area. It's obviously a wildland type situation, backcountry situation, whatever you want to call it. And several people that were involved in that setting up of that standard or had to deal with it here in California um, brought up that exact same point is we're supposed to be light, mobile, agile to, to get these guys that are in trouble. Why are they making us carry this 12 and a half millimeter rope and this hardware cache is really not, ne- not necessary in most cases. Rack and, uh, pulley Munter is, I mean, yeah. rack pulley Mariner's hitch is still in the standard. Exactly. And, um, uh, I, I know people that are that are on both sides of that that are bringing it up and going, why is it like that? And I, I hope that they're modifying it. I can't say for sure that they are, but it, it was ridiculous when you looked at the list of things that they had to have and um, right, wrong or otherwise, a lot of people follow whatever's out there first. And it's unfortunate because it it, it was not designed for the equipment cash was not designed for the application in, in many, many opinions, including mine and it sounds like yours yeah and, and nor is it designed to accomplish the task no it wasn't it was right? throw a it's, bunch of stuff together and get grant money or something i don't know yep kind of getting political on that so we're getting <laughs> getting close to kind of winding things up here guys we didn't even get into into the thing about um a lot of the lightweight gear and and ppe we we touched on it and there's probably a lot more that we want to do anybody would want to kind of do a summary of 
what you have to say or think about backcountry rescue and uh oh <laughs> and then we'll, we'll go for it uh, fred you're smiling first yeah it you know i'll go back to uh when we're talking about fire departments and we're talking about search and rescue teams sometimes we're comparing apples to pears um you know, I was poking a little bit about to Craig about, you know, the, the lighter weight stuff, but it comes down to, you know, where's our critical thinking skills? There is a time and place for every piece of equipment. Um, if we could come up with one tool that did everything, we'd be millionaires. But, you know, humping 13 millimeter rope three miles in versus putting in an elevator taking it up to the roof and then repelling down the side. That's night and day. So it, it's that critical thinking, A to Z thinking, uh, the right tool for the right job. Uh, I could say for here um, it, in La Plata County, uh, the fire department, they use climbing harnesses uh, just like the uh, search and rescue team. Um we do have team equipment, but most of the rigging that we do, we do off our harnesses. The fire department is the same way. Um, we do have 12.5 ropes, and we have some pre-plans where that is the rope, a 900-foot guiding line <laughs> coming out of East Animus um, with a knot in the middle uh, that gets, uh, you know, a lot of force put on it. They, you know, it's that's the bigger rope because we're, you know, over stressing it some in, in that application. But we also have 11 mil and we have nine, eight and we take, you know, the, the right rope for the, the right situation. Um, but, uh, you know, so here we don't have two caches of gear, really. Um, we've kind of rotated to a smaller pulleys that are wide enough to, to take the 12, five rope. Um, and that's what we use for everything because sometimes I mean, when I first got here, I had smaller pulleys that didn't take 12, five. And of course the next call I went on, they, you know, it was, they brought the 12, five rope and I didn't have any pulleys that worked on it. So the, now we carry that. That's what's in our team cash gear. If that, if that actually shows up, but most people are rigging off their harnesses. Greg, your thoughts. Uh, Bruce, I think you're, I think you're in a rare, uh, fantastic place, um, uh, that, especially on the fire side that, that in some places they would say allows that to happen. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Uh, I, this is all, this is all an evolution. Um, going to skinny rope, it's going to happen. Engineering material science will slowly drive us that way. I think at times there's too much of a rush to get there when there maybe isn't a need. Uh, 11 mil is pretty magic rope. When you can have 40 K and 11 mil rope uh, that has a fair amount of stretch and gives you that safety, that's, that's pretty magic stuff. Um, but we'll, we'll see the evolution happen and we'll see the evolution happen as the manufacturers um, start to supply gear that makes that skinnier rope used in more of a mainstream way. Right now, so much of the small rope stuff is being based off climbing systems. It's they're running plaquette style devices, climbers belay devices, um, you know, different types of friction hitches, and, and that doesn't that doesn't play well with the more traditional technical fire and industrial training. But once once the gear starts to match, it, it's just going to flow. And you're seeing that in your training, obviously, or uh, getting that. When I think. It's something that um, probably all of us have seen. I know Bruce and I have where, um, you know, we had the two caches of gear. Now we don't. Um, we're seeing the local fire departments, at least some of them go to that same direction um, where they realize that they don't really need to have, in most situations, that strong a rope, and especially if it's a higher trained technical type of team. Um, you know, they're trying to take that and. Something that I've always said is all these rescue techniques came from climbers and cavers. And in, in my history, we, we went from um, 11 millimeter rope only. We didn't call it that. We called it 716 in those days because that's the way we were. But 
we went from from that size to big rope and now we're back down to small rope again although it's a hell of a lot stronger and has a heck of a lot less stretch than gold line did but um you know these things move around and as people use them more in the backcountry i think that's where these things came from with the climbing and the caving as i said and then the in, in Dutch, industrial municipal departments are going to pick up on it a little bit it's going to take a long time it's a big boat to turn the one thing i see is as we're becoming the old guys in the profession uh, the y generation is coming in and challenging our mainstay of thinking which i think is a good thing because it's pushing us to look at new techniques and really question why have we done it because we've always done it that way well now you know and, and teaching with bruce for years you know apply some science to things and look at how stuff works and go you know does it really have to be that strong um you know do we really need a 76 can rated eight plate or can we get away with the 36 you know <laughs> aluminum you know what are we doing and i think that's what stack them <laughs> those are anchor plates we're talking about <laughs> i sure that's something different um but uh but i think i think the younger generation is, is kind of pushing us and, and challenging some of the way we've always thought about stuff and i think that's going to push us forward um and, and to evolve into truly truly beyond technical and extremely specialized type of rescues. Well, thank you. We've, uh, we, we've managed to take a lot of time. I hope we, uh, it's been interesting for the listeners, and hopefully it's brought up some things to think about. I'm sure that we'll come back to this subject again. A lot of these things you could go on to for a whole hour about uh, the equipment or the level of training or anything like that. Um, so I, I appreciate all your time. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much for your time.